Welcome. I put this video together mainly for myself, but also for anybody who is into integrated circuit design. Google has this new open source silicon initiative. They've been doing it for a little while now with a company called Skywater, and as we'll see, eFabulous. But on Wednesday, August 3rd, they announced a new initiative with Global Foundries to use their 180 nanometer process and make that available to the community. And this video is my own. I have no relationship with Google or any of the other companies or organizations represented. This is just me trying to put together information to organize it for myself. And what I'm going to cover in this video is just a quick look at how this process works and a look at some of the online documentation that's currently out there, including the device characteristic curves for MOSFETs and things like the library of digital cells available. So let's get started with these bullet points. Um, this initiative is not completely new. Um, Google has worked with a company called Skywater with a 130 nanometer process and offered the ability to fab chips through that. But from what I understand, um, on August 3rd, they announced their relationship with Global Foundries. And they're adding then the bulk, C my understanding, so again, everything I'm saying in this is unofficial and I could be wrong on some stuff, but this is my take after looking through things. They're adding the Global Foundries 180 nanometer process. I put that in quotes because as we'll see, some of the FETs are longer channeled than that. Anyway, this process um, is nominally a 3.3 volt, but they also have 6 volt option in it. And like the Skywater, it appears to be both digital and full custom, which I, I assume could include radio frequency circuits. The process design kit is released under the open source Apache 2.0 license. You can go out there and read about that. I'm, I'm still reading it myself. And it uses eFabless for the design process, who you submit things to, etc. And the documentation is out there in GitHub. So many software people know all about GitHub. I don't know that much about it. So don't ask me questions about GitHub. I'm still learning. And you can do chips now for $10,000. That's a lot of money. But for IC design, that's comparatively cheap some, in some ways. And that'll give you about 10 millimeters. I think this is really about 3.3 by 3.5 millimeter of space available there. But because Google is involved, they have a free initiative, but it's kind of competitive. Now on each of these slides, um, I've put a link down at the bottom and you can freeze the slide and laboriously type this in or if I post this PowerPoint somewhere, then you could click on it. But uh, all of this information is from these sources that I have linked down below. So I won't spend a lot of time on each slide. You can go to these links and learn a lot more than I'm going to tell you here. Uh, but this slide is about who is Global Foundries. And I went to their site, and this is what they say about themselves. They make chips that transcend traditional paradigms. And I went to Wikipedia and snapshotted a little bit of what they say about Global Foundries. So you could pause this video here and read this, or you can go to the link on Wikipedia. Now, I mentioned this thing called eFabulous, which I did not know about until today when I was reading through the documents online. And eFabulous... It looks like to me this is what I'm going to call Moses Reborn. And if you don't know what Moses is, it was an organization out in California that would assemble IC designs and amortize the cost across many different projects. So you get things called multi-project wafers. There's other names for these things. And what that does is it takes, you know, 100000 several hundred thousand dollars, and it splits that cost among many different people or organizations. And eFabulous <laughs> and e -fabulous seems to be uh, the same thing. Now, I think Moses is still in existence, but I personally stopped using it at the university because it got complicated uh, with the legal situation, you had to have students sign legal agreements or at least accept responsibility for things students did. Uh, I wasn't willing to do that. But here it says Chip Ignite, which is part of eFabulous, 
uh, has open source technology and no legal agreements. So it looks like it's returning to the foundations of MOSIS, which was designed to let students learn how to make integrated circuits. But it's also, as it says down here, for startups or research groups. The price for them is about $10,000, but again, Google has an initiative where they seem to be making some runs competitively, some IC fabs available for free. I think that might be just to universities, but I don't know. So we got eFabless, and we also have something called Chip Ignite, and I'll let you read more about it on the eFabless site. But here is an interesting thing. This is snapshotted from the eFabless site. And what you can see is about 10 square millimeter space where you can do your own designs. And then they've already got a pad frame and they even have a microprocessor down here. So this seems like an Arduino style environment, except it's for hardware. Over here on the right is an example schedule for Chip Ignite runs, and I think these are probably for the Skywater. I don't know. Again, I'm learning. But it looks like they run about every other quarter. And some of them, um, you can get the parts assembled, and other ones you get bare die. I guess it depends on when you're fabbing. And I mentioned multi-project wafers a minute ago. Um, so they have these open MPW runs or Chip Ignite runs. Uh, again, you'll have to learn more about it yourself. I'm still learning. But Chip Ignite is a commercial version of the same solution uh, that supports private projects and guaranteed reservations on a shuttle. And I added this note down here. Hmm, will Global Foundries be offered through Chip Ignite? Or is Global Foundries only going to be available through the Google initiative, which would require you to release your designs as open source. I don't know the answer to that. So this stuff is open source. And so let's delve in and look at the process itself. It is nominally a 180 nanometer process. And they're emphasizing on this site that this is an experimental preview. And again, this is my take. So there's errors in this, I'm sure. And those errors are mine. Uh, but nevertheless, this is an experimental preview from Google and Global Foundries also. So if you go to this site, they cover things like digital libraries, custom design, et cetera, et cetera. I'm only gonna go into the first two here. And I'm not that much of a digital person. I'm more of a custom mixed signal RF integrated circuit design person. So I'm gonna look at custom design first. When you click on custom design in the menu, uh, you get something like this. And it's interesting, it says Singapore. So Global Foundries has sites everywhere. Uh, I don't know if this means that they're going to only run through Singapore. I, I don't know. But there is tons of information out here, especially on the custom design link. So what I'm going to show you here are just very small examples of what's out there. Over on the right-hand side is a stack up of the metals in a one poly five metal version of the process. And this is on the main Google blog post. But it's also buried within this information as well. I did, I did see it there as well. So if you click on custom design, the next level menu you see will say electrical specifications, specifications for the 180 MCU process, interconnect specs, model parameters uh, for SPICE models, etc. So I just pulled one little thing on that because as an analog IC designer, I like to know things like what's the resistance of these metals, what's the resistance of poly. We'll get to the FETs here in a second. But here's some of the resistance examples, and, and they're very normal kind of things. So for N plus diffusion, it's about six ohms per square according to this document, but it can range a lot. The P plus poly is nominally 350 ohms per square, and N well is a thousand ohms per square. And this P plus poly listing is for the unsalicited version, which is used for high value resistors. So this is 350 ohms per square. On a gate, it would be closer to the 6.3. I, I didn't print everything here. Um, you can go to the site and look it up if you want. But I think it's like 7 for the P plus salicided. The metals, uh, let's take a look at them. They are, looks like about half micron for most of the layers. 
except top metal is one micron for this particular nine kiloangstrom top metal process. Uh, note while I'm zoomed in on this slide that there's also a memcap option, or I don't, I don't think it's an option. I think there's memcap in this. And uh, so within the documentation, you can figure out what the femtofarads per micron squared is for that. So for the half micron thick-ish metal, um, it's about 90 milliohms per square. And for the top metal, which is about twice as thick, it's about half as much as it should be. <laughs> One thing I have not found in the documentation yet, it might be there, I just have not found it yet, is what is the resistivity of the substrate? So if you're doing RF integrated circuits, you probably ought to know that so you can try to figure out what the losses would be if you build inductors. But most people aren't interested in that, so let's move on. The next thing of interest, um, to me at least, would be the FETs. What are they like? What's the threshold? What's the GM value, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So buried in dozens or hundreds of pages in these menus here, I pulled out the information for the 3.3 volt FETs. This is for the N channel, and this is for the P channel. And for the N channel, it's nominally 0.63 volt, and for the P channel, 0.73 volt. So if we're running at 3.3 volt, we can stack several FETs in an analog design or digital gates or something like that, no problem. But if we're doing an analog design, we need to know a whole lot more than that. We need to know things like what is the transconductance value for the FETs. And I have not abstracted that from these documents. It's not going to be listed, but the information I found in the custom design menus, uh, that will expand into a lot of other menus, and some of them are on the MOSFETs. And on the MOSFETs, you can look at the 3.3 volt ones. They also have 6 volt ones for mixed signal, maybe some power circuits or something. And they have CV characteristics, uh, which some people like, but I mainly like the current voltage characteristics. So let's zoom in on this one in the upper right. And this is for a 10 by 0.28 by 25. Here's VDS as normal on the x-axis and the current on the y-axis. And I'm going to guess based on the currents here that um, you know, these are like almost 5 milliamps, that maybe this is 25 copies of these things. And so from this information, we could extract what the GM value is and what the little RD value is for the analog models. So that's great. And they've also got different curves depending on the body to source voltage. So that tells me this is just a normal bulk CMOS process. And we'll have to be attentive to those things when we stack FETs. Now one thing that initially annoyed me when I was using this online menu system was when I clicked on something like custom design, the URL didn't say custom design in it, it said something else. And I, I quickly got lost, I didn't know where I was. But it turns out that there is a path up here. I didn't see it initially, but um, if you want to know where I am, I'm not in custom design, I'm deep down below it. So this was the top level, I guess. And then I clicked on, I think, custom design and then model parameters and then fab 3E spice model for 0.18, etc. And then 8.0 model to hardware correlation. So clearly there's a lot of depth literally to these menus. But again, if you want to jump right to what you're seeing on each of these slides, I put the direct link uh, down at the bottom here. Now, if we come back over to the left hand side and click on digital libraries, we get something like this. Actually, this is not the next level down. This is like two levels down um, because you get to select seven or nine track standard cells. Anyway, there are a bunch of standard cells. And on the right hand side over here, I just captured a few of those. There are probably hundreds of them. I don't know. They have different uh, buffers at different strengths. Uh, clock inverters, they've got D flip-flops, etc., etc. But in this long list, I found my way to a simple AND gate because I wanted to know how fast these things are and what, what was in there in the toolkit. And one nice thing I found there was the actual layout. So this is the layout for an AND gate. So it has a NAND gate, which is this left-hand side over here, followed by an inverter to make it an AND gate. 
Interestingly, that is not what they showed as the schematic. They just showed an AND gate symbol. But you can look at the layouts and figure stuff out if you want. Um, here is the VSS metal down here, this dotted box. And this is, of course, the N plus diffusion, the green stuff, and the reds are polys. Pretty much normal coloring for these things. Except I'm just noticing that uh, the P channel stuff is also green. So that's weird. So I guess P just means active. And then there's a bunch of dotted boxes for the wells. I haven't deciphered what all the different layers are yet. But this is the main geometry for the AND gate. The two input one, I think this was the single strength. Looking at some of the performance stuff that I captured, um, there's capacitances listed. Looks like 2.8 femtofarads for either of the two inputs looking into it. And there's some speed information down here, delay and output transition times. Uh, you, again, you can freeze these slides and, and digest this at your leisure. But very quickly, it looks like the delay is about 220-something picoseconds. Now, remember that's for an AND gate, so you're basically going through uh, an AND and an inverter. So I guess for a single layer, you've got about 100 picoseconds, a little bit more. And it looks like the output transition times are 40 to 50 picoseconds. Again, fair warning, these are experimental uh, information only, and this is uh, what I pulled out. You should be looking at these things yourself in your own designs. So that's as far as I'm going to go in this video. Um, the one thing that I really want to figure out next is what are the ADA tools available here? At a school, you may have access to something like Cadence software, and that's great. Um, it's interesting over here. It says supports commercial EDA tools as well. Use commercial EDA tools to implement your project or sub-project macros. Open source tools can still be used for final integration and assembly. So I don't know if that means you need to use some of the open source tools or not. They claim that they have open source tools, but I don't know what they are. I haven't found that yet. I'm sure it's out there. I just haven't found it in all the documentation online. So that's it for this video. I um, hope it's useful to you. Uh, again, just my way of collecting my own thoughts, and hopefully it's good for somebody else as well. Thanks for watching.